Okay, um, this is our second uh, lecture for GINS 352, um, and it talks about how we um, build a logical chain or a logical tree in order to make a case in order to hopefully convince someone to change their mind when they're wrong. Hopefully you've already watched uh, our first video, um, talked about uh, Hans Rosling's washing machine, all those good things. If not, you probably wanna do those um, because we are gonna keep using the five things um, the five Greek words as we go through um, the course. Now, I think you know in a simple way how we build a logical argument. And, um, you know, we start with assumptions and we start with evidence and we go from those through logical conclusions to get to hopefully a final conclusion that demonstrates to other people that we're right. Um, mathematical proofs are where you probably saw this most cleanly. And um, high school geometry is maybe where you did uh, this the most directly, where you started with something about triangles and then you got to a conclusion about how they were similar or congruent or whatever it was you were doing. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna do the same thing, but instead of just using deductive reasoning where we start from assumptions and go to conclusions, we're gonna use inductive reasoning where we start with evidence and try to work back to first principles. It's not nearly as elegant as mathematical proofs, um, but it's often necessary. Um, you sure you've seen this cartoon about the then a miracle occurs in the middle of your proof. Um, geometry teachers all over the world love to use it, I think. Um, but the idea that we want to minimize that, and we're able to do that because we aren't just using the mathematical principles, but we're able to use things that we see in the world around us. Now, I take a little bit of um, um, my own innovation here that many people call these logical chains, but a chain implies that each link builds off the other and there's a single strand of logic that's leading you to that. But I actually think it branches out to become more of what you might call a logic web or a logic tree. And actually logic tree is the phrase I tend to use. The other part of this that I want you to think about is we can use more than just uh, logos this idea that we're gonna use evidence and mathematical logic or whatever kind of logic we're gonna use. But we can bring in emotional arguments. We can bring in our authority as an expert. We can look at the times that we're in and the place that we are. And we can think about how these things fit together within a single topic. So in a sense, we have a little bit more power than you had in geometry class because we can now um, not just use a single uh, kind of technique or a single method. And so again, you get this web or this tree because you're bringing in arguments from different sources, certainly from different disciplines. So um, the first one you might wanna think about is the washing machine again. And this idea of what was he trying to prove? What did he uh, do for his conclusion? How did he get from start to finish? We know he brought in logos and ethos and pathos, but how did he bring in these different forms of logic and these different studies of discipline? Certainly he wasn't being a health statistician the whole time he was speaking. And how did that help him uh, to be effective? We're gonna actually talk about this in the live session. So um, if you wanna scribble down some thoughts so you're ready to have that there, or maybe you just have it there from your uh, washing machine video washing uh, from before. So we can go to a bigger example about climate action. So we know there are still people arguing about climate change, about what we should do about it, but the scientific consensus is done. The idea that there is climate change, humans are causing it and we need to do something about it, to scientists seems very clear. Yet many politicians are not acting. Some people would say this is because evil corporations are filling the airwaves with lies and cheating and theft and stealing and all kinds of things, and maybe that's true, but how are we building these arguments? Could we have been more effective? I'm certainly a survey statistician. So the idea that we could take data and be more effective in other ways. So let's take a second to just think about what we do know about the evidence about climate change and what evidence uh, we're gonna use and how the different disciplines work together to get to it. So let me start with the original premise that uh, funds a lot of this thinking about climate change. And that is the idea that there's more CO2 in the atmosphere than there was before. And this is a thing that I'm pretty sure no one disputes now. And um, the data that we have from this uh, started with a guy 
uh, named uh, Keeling. And Charles David Keeling was a scientist at the Scripps Observatory um, out of San Diego. And he went to Mauna Loa Observatory, which is an observatory up in the uh, mountains of Hawaii. Um, and the idea was that because it's far from any industrial things, um, he would be able to get really clear results. He started taking it in 1958, and they're still taking the measurements today. He took the measurements once a month. And he was actually there because he was interested in um, this uh, uh, seasonal effect, this idea that um, within a year, there would be more CO2 in the air in the autumn as, uh, I'm sorry, there'd be more CO2 in the winter and the Northern hemisphere winter because there would be fewer trees. And so he was really interested in the study of trees. So this top little inset is what he suspected to find. But what he did find was that while that effect was there, it actually was part of this overall increase in there. And so if you zoom into this, and you can go, this is just on the Keeling Curve Wikipedia page, you can see that that seasonal variation is there inside of each of those little up and downing uh, parts. Um, your trig professor, your trig teacher would be happy that you've now seen trig in the real world. But the part he didn't expect to see was how much the CO2 levels were going up more generally. And that blue line is smoothed across the year to account for that seasonal variation. And what you can see though, is that it was generally going up. Um, there's one level spot here, right here. Um, that's actually when Mount Pinatubo, the volcano erupted in the South Pacific, and it did actually uh, change CO2 levels as a result because it released the chemicals into the air that absorbed and uh, did chemistry things uh, with CO2. But the idea that people are arguing about whether this is an uphill line is not a very interesting argument. That's an uppy line. If we were in a regression class, we could calculate the slope um, and find the variation. Um, if we were in a more advanced stats class, we could understand that uh, trig stuff going on there in the time series. And again, statisticians are not interested in talking about whether or not this line goes uphill because it does. But when we think about validity, when we think about what it means, you could start to ask some questions about that. And one of those questions um, might be, how has this been going on for a long time? So here is uh, at the Scripps Observatory class site, which is UCSD, UC San Diego, uh, does this. And, you know, if we zoom in, what does it look like for the last year? Well, we can see that seasonal effect, but we can see it balancing out. What does it look like if we just look at a week or a month or six months? or two years, right? We can see that uh, there are lots of wiggles to it. We can see that the averages aren't necessarily smooth. Something was happening over there in April of 2019. As we did that, we know 2020 is a weird year to look at things. Um, we could think about some other things. Uh, this is from a page called Skeptical Science. And one of the questions that it was looking for was, well, maybe Mauna Loa is a weird place, right? We know that it's away from industrial things, but it's right near volcanoes. Maybe the volcanoes are releasing CO2. So this chart, which um, is a little hard to see because the Barrow data is in that cyan, that light blue. Um, but you can see that data from Barrow, which is the northern part of Alaska, from Samoa in the South Pacific, and from the South Pole, all have that same up and down pattern. We do notice that Barrow, Alaska has the largest up and down <clears throat> that actually supports Keeling's original thing because they're near the Canadian forest, which is uh, one of the big seasonal sinks for CO2 that the trees suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We see that Samoa, which is not near any trees because it's in the middle of the ocean, and it's a much smaller island than even the island of Hawaii, so it doesn't have many trees on it. And then the South Pole has almost no variation. And in fact, the South Pole is also a little bit lower than the readings from the other places, which does suggest, again, that um, not being by humans uh, might mean you have a lower CO2 level. Um, the other thing we sometimes look at, and this is uh, the 800,000 years. So rather than just using air samples, this is using ice core samples. So speaking of South Pole, 
And what we see here is that um, this increase in the last year really is strange as we look at history. And we can see that back here. Um, if we look at the 10,000 year record using ice core data, this is again at Mauna Loa, we can see that it was actually pretty level for the last 10,000 years and then it's gone up a ton. It was between like 220 and 240. <clears throat> and then it did actually go down a little bit um, there. You can see more recent data is bumpier because we have better data for more recent things. We can look at tree rings. Um, we can look at several different sources for that. And then that idea that we can look at 800,000 years and get this chart. Um, and again, that's the same chart that I have here. Um, but we can see that here about 300,000 years ago, it was 300 uh, parts per million. That was what we hit about um, 40 years ago when I was a kid. And now we're up above 400, we're about 430 uh, parts per million for CO2. Um, so that's a pretty, um, you know, significant difference. We have evidence that it was higher millions of years ago. It's one reason why the dinosaurs were shown to be in a kind of a tropical jungle. Um, but again, that idea that when there's more CO2 in the air, it's just warmer. Um, so um, this is another chart of the Barrow, Mauna Loa, Samoa South Pole data that zooms in a little bit more, gives you more granular differences. And again, you can see that that's an uphill line regardless of what you're looking at. And even at the South Pole, which I said is a little lower than the black line, the global trend, um, the South Pole is uh, where the lowest CO2 readings are taken. So the question that we get to though is, how do we go from there to, you should drive a Prius, you should install new light bulbs, um, that don't use uh, quite as much electricity. Or we should have something more at the macro level, a carbon tax or a cap and trade system as we do this. So um, I actually have an assignment for you where you're gonna talk about that um, from National Geographic where it builds a logic tree. And the question that I have for you in that response is, how does it do? Does it actually build um, a model um, doing um, um, the logic tree, the logic chain about uh, climate change and how it works. There's a similar one that EDF has um, that builds a similar thing looking at different sources. And I have that source on the web page as well. Um, the third example I want to give you, and again, there'll be a discussion question about it in the uh, Google Classroom, is about a book called The Bell Curve. So The Bell Curve was a book that came out in 1994. Um, it was when I was in college, it was very controversial. Um, and the point of the book was that differences in intelligence show that there is a strong genetic effect. And <clears throat> um, that this intelligence is real and all the people who'd been saying that you can spend money in schools and get uh, poor kids to become smarter were wasting their time. Um, it was super controversial when it came out because one of its major claims was about race and the idea that there was literally a difference in IQs between white Americans and African Americans. And um, the book came out 25 years ago and um, it is still a thing that people argue about. So here are the five uh, points. Um, and again, the idea is that IQ is real, it predicts success, it's to some extent truly genetic, that education, sending kids books like Dolly Parton likes to do, um, all of those kind of things can't fully um, bring the bottom up. And again, most controversially, that US black students were lower IQ than uh, white, white students on average. And as a result, we should, instead of trying to figure out ways to help the less smart people among us to become smart, we should instead think of ways for them to be functional without being smart. And so, for instance, they suggested, um, you know, not requiring people to go to high school and, and these other kind of very controversial things. Um, there are uh, two Wikipedia pages that I want you to look at um, that kind of walk through that article, I have the one here, and then there's another whole page on the controversy about the bell curve. And again, this book came out 25 years ago. 
And um, I point it out to you because it's one where people think the logic uh, tree was not well constructed. And um, one of the things that happens when you build a logic tree is that you sort of constrain people who want to criticize you because now they have to live within the structure that you've put in. Um, we in statistics think that's good because if you use a statistical argument that limits the way people can reply to you. Similarly, if you make a biblical article uh, argument, if you make a philosophical argument, a mathematical argument, the people pretty much have to answer you on your own terms. So I give a, a link here to a Vox article um, that uh, criticizes the bell curve. And again, I'm not asking you to read the bell curve. It's about 600 pages long, so it's probably not something that you want to do. Um, but that's how we actually function in society. People don't go and read the book. You look at several news accounts, maybe a Wikipedia page, maybe a couple of different things, and you make your own judgment about it. Now, did the authors seem to make a logic tree that works? Want to know what disciplines they're using? Were they using uh, the elements correctly? And again, this would be both uh, the original um, article as well as any responses to it. Charles Murray is the person's name. And um, how compelling is it? And again, there's a Vox article that I linked to um, that I asked you uh, to read. This is from 2017, but Charles Murray is still writing. He has a new book out uh, summer of 2020 and he did a webinar. Um, oops, this is a newer article. He did a webinar in uh, October, 2020. Um, and he did a webinar at Harvard and uh, the Harvard Crimson, which is the newspaper there, has an article about um, how they think uh, the work is flawed. So I'm asking you, what do you think? And again, I'm not asking you to read a 600 page book because I know you're not gonna do that, uh, especially with all the other reading we have in the class. But really this question of how do we evaluate other people's arguments? Again, later in the semester, we're gonna ask you to build your own arguments. That's what your term paper is about. We're going to ask you to help other people change their mind if they're wrong. And as part of that, this assignment, which again is split up into several different discussion posts, asks you to think about how these people build their arguments, um, both the washing machine with Hans Rosling, with climate change, and with this bell curve book. Um, and how do they do? And how compelling is it? Would it make you change their mind? Maybe you already agree with what they were saying anyway. But um, how are uh, these arguments being perceived? How are you perceiving them and how convincing are they? Okay, so that is uh, our second lecture.